On April 27th, German Busso Party Chairwoman Helga Zepp-Larouche hosted a webcast titled Dialogue with Spain and Portugal on the Global Crisis and the Future of Europe. In the context of the impending collapse of the European system, which threatens the very continued existence of the United States as well, we here at LaRouche Pack would like to bring you the recording of this historical event to our viewers internationally. Muy buenas noches a todos Good evening. Uh, Les la I want to welcome a esta to this uh, webcast, international webcast Helga of uh, Helga Sepla Rouge in a dialogue with Spain and Portugal about the global crisis and the future of Europe. Mi es Dennis My Small. name is Soy Dennis Small. I'm the director of the Ibero-American Affairs Ibero of the EIR, Executive Ibero Intelligence Ibero Review, and of uh, Lyndon LaRouche's movement. Gusto. And I'm very Saludarlos pleased to Welcome you to this meeting. Esta es una reunión de emergencia. This is an emergency meeting. Estamos en una We are in a critical situation where del sistema the whole system, fina international financial system, is disintegrating and the world is in danger in, uh, in weeks or months or days to start a uh, worldwide uh, war, a thermonuclear war. In order to underline the importance and the emergency of this meeting, today in Spain was announced officially that the, the level of unemployment has increased to 20%. Uh, 4.4 percent. The fourth, uh, one fourth of the uh, population is not working, and among the youth, is much worse. Uh, and in a high level. The uh, European banks are in bankruptcy. The IMF itself, that is the police, policemen of the British Empire and the allies in Wall Street and London, announced in a in a, a report last week that the level of debt unpayable debt in the European banks, according to them, is more than Three trillion, billions, three trillion uh, euros. Y nos and we found, found out, speaking with somebody who participated in that IMF meeting, que lo que se that fue what they published is a second uh, version of a first uh, a report that the uh, debt de la banca of the uh, European Bank is, is uh, in fact, seven trillion uh, euros. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of the problem. The empire has its solution. They are speaking to about bailouts of the banks. They want to establish gambling uh, economies of uh, uh, drug trafficking and prostitution in Europe. But more, they are beyond, they, are, they want to reduce the unemployment. Uh, reducing the population with a policy, genocidal policy of the population, where they are proposing yesterday the uh, Royal Society in Great Britain proposed to reduce the population in the world, and, the, uh, and, and they are saying even that the uh, Prince Philip and, and uh, Prince Ber Bernhard, uh, who founded the WWF, they are saying that they have to reduce the population from 7 billion people to less than a a billion people. That's what they are proposing. We are now in a in a situation, as Schiller said, that is a great moment in history. The problem, as Schiller said, when he was speaking about the French Revolution, that that great moment found uh, very little people, that it wasn't to the level of the crisis. That's the, um, what we are confronting, and nobody is more capable to um, address this problem that our uh, special he uh, guest, Helga Sepp-Larouche, who, who is, a, who is knowledgeable and she has studied and acted of precisely this question. When in 1989 the uh, Berlin Wall collapsed, Helga and 
In the international movement of Lyndon LaRouche, but especially our European organization uh, directed by Helga uh, LaRouche, proposed a productive triangle for uh, infrastructure and economic development in order to uh, get out of the disintegration of the empire, the Soviet system. And, and she uh, developed uh, the um, land bridge. She is the author and, and co-author of these uh, programmatic proposals in order to get out of the crisis. But Helga, as well, is an intellectual, original intellectual who has worked, for example, in the, in the great uh, philosopher and uh, scientist of uh, the uh, uh, 15th century, Nicholas of Kuz, who proposed and organized what was the uh, way out of the crisis that almost destroyed the, the civilization in the 14th century. Nicholas of Kuz, who was the author and the architect of the modern science and the national sovereign state of profound concepts, uh, maybe difficult but necessary to solve the situation today. Helga is uh, the president of the uh, German party Buso, uh, uh, and she has been a candidate, uh, chancellor, and has traveled around the world, Russia, China, uh, all over Europe, obviously Brazil, Mexico, um, among other things. He, she met several times with uh, the President López Portillo in very famous meetings uh, uh, that happened while the President lived. Uh, our meeting today in, in which we have uh, special guests and meetings that are participating through internet in Spain, in Valencia, Barcelona, Murcia, Madrid, but also in the uh, Canary Island, where the Radio Candelaria announced uh, in an interview with one of our representatives, announced the meeting, and in Portugal, Ar uh, Mexico, Argentina, and other places. Mrs. Helga LaRouche will speak in English, and it will be interpreted in Spanish simultaneously. The questions that you have, you can send them uh, to uh, our website. Uh, questions that can be in Spanish or English or Portuguese and will be translated and it will be they will be read and Mrs. LaRouche will uh, answer. For the, the rest of our discussion today, I want you uh, to introduce uh, Kasia Krushkovsky, who is a leader of the movement of youth uh, members, La Rouge youth members, and also of the Buso party in Germany. She is actually um, um, a candidate for the um, uh, uh, state legislature of the Rhin uh, Westphalia, and she is uh, originally from Polish. She lives in German, uh, but she will speak to you in English. And I present to you Kasia and then Helga Seplarusz. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, we want to welcome you to this uh, live event, and uh, I just want um, to no let you know that right after the presentation, uh, there will be uh, the possibility to ask questions and get involved in a discussion with Helga Seplarouche. So I want to encourage you to send your questions uh, during the presentation to the email address uh, preguntas at larouchepub.com and uh, we do our best to address uh, most of them. Um, and now I may uh, introduce to you Helga Zeplarouche. Hello, um, I greet you. And indeed, I want to speak about the two existential dangers which threaten the existence of mankind right now. Uh, one, Dennis already mentioned, and that is that we are sitting on a volcano, a volcano which could erupt in minutes, in seconds, while we are speaking here, or in weeks, uh, leading to a global thermonuclear war. The second, equally, 
existential question is the fact that the present global financial system, but especially the transatlantic part of that system, is about to disintegrate. I think it is important to face these dangers, but let me say in the beginning that the purpose of this webcast is not to just look at the horrible condition in which the world finds itself, but the purpose of this webcast is to address ourselves, especially to the people in Spain and Portugal who are hit right now with the consequences of a completely incompetent and I would even say malicious policy on the side of the European Union and to start to discuss the fact that Mrs. Merkel is not right when she says there is no alternative. This is the most favorite sentence of Mrs. Merkel. She always says there is no alternative to the euro, there is no alternative to the fiscal austerity, to the debt break, uh, to the bailouts. Now, that is all not true. There is an alternative, and that alternative has been tested in history. It is called Class Diegel. That was the banking separation which was introduced by Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933 and which led America out of the Depression uh, in the 30s. Now, that can be applied today. There are also other forms of uh, financial systems. You don't have to stick with a bankrupt monetary system. There is the possibility to go to a credit system. And there is a quite elaborated plan for the economic reconstruction of the United States, of Europe, and even the world economy. And I want to solicit from this program people from Spain, Portugal, but also other countries to help to put together a reconstruction program, which we have already basically ready in outlines, but I want to have the collaboration of engineers, scientists, students, trade unions, and other people to help to put it on the, on the table uh, quickly. Now, this system is finished. The Eurozone is about to break apart. Nobody knows this better than the people in Spain, uh, where Standard & Poor was just downgrading uh, Spanish uh, debt uh, by two notches uh, to, I think, triple B, three notches above junk status, which means that the interest rate which Spain will have to pay from here on for any kind of credit will become more and more unpayable. Now, to the best of our knowledge, the entire European banking system is bankrupt. And Spain is just the tip of the iceberg or just one element uh, of this. Uh, Dennis already mentioned that at the recent IMF meeting in Washington in last weekend, uh, behind the scenes there was quite some turmoil. Being bankers were talking about an uh, about to happen crisis bigger than Lehman Brothers, uh, the figure of uh, minimum seven to eight uh, trillion euro uh, which would be needed to save only the private sector of the European banking system until the end of this year. Now, this is no more peanuts. This is trillions. And if you add that to the 29 trillion uh, which had been injected in the American banking system, you already see that we are talking about hyperinflation. Because if you start pumping that kind of money into the banking system, uh, with no limit, um, then you know you are very quickly approaching a situation like in 1923 in Germany, but this time in the entire transatlantic region. Now, this figure was so big um, that the IMF, according to reliable sources, decided not to make it public because they feared it would spread panic. Uh, so they decided to put out the figure of 3.8 trillion needed, uh, and then they came up with a ridiculous 430 billion, uh, a sum which has not even been brought together because this has to be approved by all the governments who have to contribute to that until the upcoming G20 meeting in June. So there is a huge gap. And one day after that, uh, in the Daily Telegraph, 
uh, a journalist, Liam Halligan, uh, said that the problem in the European banking system is that the banks have trillions of euro of not reported losses. And that is obviously what they needed this amount of money for. So we have reached a point where if you look back when the financial crisis erupted uh, in July 2007, rather than acknowledging uh, the fact that the casino economy had failed, uh, a process of almost five, year, five years of one bailout after the other was put in motion. And, you know, these bailouts have done only one thing. They have transformed private gambling debt, casino debt, into state debt. Now, then, you know, the state uh, states which have given out these bailouts naturally say, now we have a state, state debt crisis and we need to cut the budget. So they go to the most brutal austerity programs. They're cutting health care. They are cutting uh, science programs. They are cutting all kinds of pensions, wages, uh, and that way ruining the real economy, which is shrinking. I mean, the rate of collapse of the real economy in all of Europe, in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, Portugal, but also the so-called rich country uh, like Germany, the real economy is just collapsing. In the United States, the real estate, real economy is in a terrible condition. Now, what they have accomplished by these bailout policies is to basically transform public, uh, private, private debt into public debt. And now, where they have reached uh, the end of the line, so to speak, they want to have quickly a combination of the so-called fiscal union, the debt break into the constitution of all member states, which is insane. Because if you have a depression, uh, like we have right now in Europe and in the United States, and you then try to reduce the state debt until it's a balanced budget, you are doing exactly the same thing what Brüning did in the beginning of the 30s with, with potentially the same consequences fascist solutions, both economically and politically. Now, if you combine this brutal austerity, you know, which is torturing uh, the countries and the people, which is killing, it's, it's already committing uh, genocide. If you look at what is happening in Greece, for example, there is no more uh, medicine for cancer patients. Uh, people have uh, basically uh, an unemployment which is skyrocketing. Uh, people are losing just any hope for the future. The young people are immigrating. Uh, in Greece, Italy, Portugal and Spain, you have this phenomena that the young people and the educated people are leaving because if you have more than 50 percent unemployment, obviously there is no uh, hope uh, in, within this present system. Now, if you combine that, however, with the idea of a continuation of the bailout uh, of the bankrupt banks through presently the EFSM, and soon, because this is not enough, they couldn't get the kind of money invested in the EFSF which they had hoped for, they want to move the permanent bailout mechanism, ESM, up to July 1st, and basically have then uh, this mechanism. Now, most of you probably know what it is, but let me just uh, quickly say what the ESM would be. The European stability mechanism, which they want to have, is basically the final step towards a dictatorship in Europe, towards a European government, which viol violates almost every constitution. It violates the German Grundgesetz, uh, it violates the ruling of the Constitutional Court, the so-called Lisbon uh, ruling of 2009, which said that if there is any more transference of power to the EU and to Brussels, you need a public referendum. Now, the people who want to push through the ESM do not want a public referendum. They want to have this mechanism, which would be uh, a governor's council, which would consist out of the finance ministers of the member states, uh, combined with a so-called uh, directorate, which would be appointed officials, not elected, not accountable to anybody, 
as a matter of fact, their inaccountability would go so far that they would be legally completely immune. No state attorney could ever investigate them, challenge them. No banking supervision could ever look if they are competent or not. And they would have enormous funds, and they could, in a seven days notice, tell any member country to give whatever sum is required without that the member country could uh, oppose it. Now, this is opening the floodgates to hyperinflation for sure. And then they would have the right to speculate with that money on the primary and secondary financial markets, uh, again, without supervision and accountability. Now, as one of the many, many anti-ESM citizens initiative, which have sprung up like mushrooms in the recent uh, weeks, has pointed out, you, if you create on the top of the EU such a law-free law -free zone where no state attorney, no judge, no police, nobody can, can look into, and they would have control over theoretically unlimited funds drawn from the state budgets, well, if it's not yet illegal, it will attract the mafia like honey the bees. Because if you have such an area, you know, I mean, with all the corruption cases, if you think of the Madoff scandal, uh, if you think about the Angelides report going into the criminal activity of many of these uh, investment banks of the hedge funds, well, you are looking at the permanent establishment of the mafia on top of the EU. Uh, you may think that this is a little bit far-fetched, but just look at the history or look at a recent interview which the former representative of the United Nations uh, fighting uh, drugs, uh, Dr. Costa, gave to EIR News Service, where he pointed out how in the banking crisis the only reason why the banking system was not collapsing was because of the injection of hundreds of billions and finally trillions of uh, drug money. And that that was not something which was offered by the mafia, but it was something in part looked for by uh, even uh, banking presidents. Um, now, that gives you a sense about the interwovenness and criminal character of this present system. Now, this, if it would come into being, would eliminate national sovereignty. It would establish the EU bureaucracy as a de facto dictatorship all over Europe. And if you look back, how did we come to this point? Well, this was the intention of the authors of the EU from the beginning. Because if you go back to the collapse of the East German government in 89, the fall of the wall. Uh, this was a moment where the communist system uh, collapsed and disintegrated between 89 and 91. And from our standpoint, this was the great historical chance of uh, Europe. You could have done everything possible. You could have started a new peace order for the 21st century. Uh, you could have, you know, turned the world into a, a functioning alliance of states for development. Now, uh, we know it did not happen. The reason why it didn't happen was because Margaret Thatcher, uh, Francois Mitterrand, and Bush Sr. Decided, decided to prevent the unified Germany from economically to become uh, strong, and especially to prevent it from playing a role in the reconstruction of of Russia. So they decided to impose the euro, uh, even if everybody at that point knew that you cannot have uh, a European monetary union without having a political union. And at that time, Chancellor Kohl said this many times. And uh, you know, nevertheless, they forced it through, through a whole bunch of very evil maneuvers. Uh, and then, basically, the European Monetary Union was decided in '92, And at that time, Jacques Attali, who was the advisor of François Mitterrand, uh, basically uh, said that this is a plan, and he admitted it later in interviews, to have a birth mistake in the EU Maastricht Treaty, which would force a crisis and then basically leave no other chance than 
uh, a political union. Now, this political union, if you look at the uh, whole process from the Maastricht Treaty till the Lisbon Treaty, the EU has become more and more a dictatorship, more and more in the interest of the banking sector and against the interest of the population. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can say that the present EU leadership and the governments who are pro-Europe um, have completely uh, descended or have completely separated from the people. And there is a complete disconnect where the people of Europe have no more the feeling that they have a place of representation. Now, this is uh, something which should not continue. The euro may detonate either because of a bankruptcy of one big bank or of a hyperinflationary collapse. Uh, in any case, this failed experiment, which could not function from the beginning, is coming to an end. It was an experiment of which we warned from the beginning. We always said that this is not um, a primary uh, currency a space because you cannot put countries which are so different in their economic structure like Greece and Germany and others into one currency union. So what you had for, for 10 years, stagnating wages in Germany, uh, a shrinking domestic market, and a so-called boom in countries like Greece, Spain, and others. But as it now is clear, that boom was a bubble. So in Spain, you are now having millions of uh, empty uh, housing constructions, a real estate market which is collapsing and is threatening to collapse even further. And it turns out this boom was a complete bubble for the speculators. And now, if you have such proposals like that of the American casino owner Edelman, who proposes to invest 35 billion into Spain to build 11 casinos uh, with uh, you know 3,000 rooms each, uh, I mean that is exactly not the way to go because we know what comes along with casinos and uh, <clears throat> uh, you know gambling. It's an increase of prostitution of uh, cheap labor, tourism, uh, cheap labor for the Spaniards and high profits for the tourist companies. So this is something which absolutely should not happen. In Spain, you have right now a crisis of brain drain, where after several years of cutting science programs, the present government wants to reduce the science and research program by even another 25%. So you have this open letter by the scientists, associations, student bodies, all saying this would be the end of science in Spain. Now, there has, has been uh, quite some protest from indignados, from trade unions, but it has not really functioned as it should have up to this point. Now, what I want to initiate or what we want to have uh, as an ongoing dialogue is there is an alternative. Now, there is only one way how the world can come out of this present economic disaster. The only way is if we organize in all European countries and in the United States as the absolute first step of emergency, a class deagle Accord exactly in the tradition of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, that would mean to separate the banks, uh, protect through the state the commercial part of the banks, so that you know this part of the banking system which is serving the real economy is protected. You do no longer give bailouts to the investment banks, and especially you shut down the shadow banking uh, sector. And as the present uh, toxic waste, amount of toxic waste in this investment banking sector uh, goes into the hundreds of trillions worldwide, a lack of their ability to, paras in a parasitical way, uh, take profit from the commercial banking sector by having access to pension funds, to savings, and so forth, it would just mean that the investment sector would just to have to declare bankruptcy. Now, the present condition 
is so bad, and I'm saying this based on information of the last couple of, of days, the real, sector, real, 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 real economy sector of Greece, Spain, and most European countries has collapsed so badly that it is in a true emergency. The same goes for the United States. The real, real economy in the United States has collapsed in the, in the recent period almost like a rock falling down. Now, the condition of the investment banks is so terrible that if you would just close them down, there is almost no legitimate liquidity left. If you take the bad loans, the toxic waste, the derivatives out of the investment banking sector, there is no more money, or very little. In any case, not enough to restart the economy. Now, this is why we need then to go to a credit system. Now, most people have no idea what a credit system is because you know they think that the economy is money, uh, that it's your banking account or the, the ability what you can buy with your monetary values. But that forget that. There is no way how that part will be saved anyway. Because if you have hyperinflation, and we as Germans know this from the experience of 1923, hyperinflation is the most brutal form of the expropriation of the population. In 1923, people were literally bringing large amounts of bills in wheelbarrows to the baker uh, until 12, because then the uh, value dropped again and it was worth nothing. So hyperinflation is just, you know, when you think you have 10,000 euro for your pension in the bank, you know, if hyperinflation explodes, uh, you pay that for one bread. So that part has to go. I mean, if we don't get rid of this speculative part of, uh, of the financial sector, nobody will have anything except maybe some people who think they can you know, save their fortunes in other ways, but they will also be the losers in the end. So therefore, we need to go to a credit system. Now, a credit system uh, has been applied several times in history very successfully. The first time it was really developed was through Alexander Hamilton, the first uh, finance minister of uh, America after the American Revolution. And it simply means that you give credit from the state in direction of future production. So if the state says, OK, I give so many uh, billions of a credit line with the idea that the following science driver projects, the following infrastructure projects, the following uh, R&D facilities are being uh, produced, then you're giving credit towards a future production. And that credit is not inflationary because it is the very uh, secret of human labor that it uh, produces added value. And that, therefore, every time this credit system policy was applied, you could find out that the tax revenue, after the project and all its side effects really got going, the tax revenue would be bigger than the initial credit given out. Now, that policy was applied again in America with the second national bank, which was in the context of the largest industrialization program in America. It was for sure applied with Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal and uh, his uh, Glass-Steagall and the whole TVA infrastructure reconstruction. It was used in Germany in the post-war period uh, through the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, uh, <clears throat> the uh, you know, reconstruction after the Second World War. And it led uh, Germany to be from a rubble field in 45, in several years to become the German economic miracle, which was admired by the whole world. Uh, and that was based on the same Roosevelt conception of the refinance corporation uh, idea. It was also used by Japan in the post-war reconstruction. And that is exactly what needs to be done now. Now, we have worked since many decades, actually, 
on such a reconstruction uh, of the world economy. But especially in the last 22 years after the fall of the wall, uh, we have worked out this idea of uniting uh, the industrial and population centers of Europe uh, with those of Asia through so-called infrastructure corridors. That is, you would take uh, Western Europe uh, and have the old historical uh, geographical lines like the Trans-Siberian Railway, the old Silk Road, and other such uh, historic organic trade connections and build them up as uh, transport corridors uniting high-speed railway, maglev trains, uh, autobahn, uh, water channels, a uh, system of channels, uh, and you know, automized, automized um, computer, computerized uh, stations for large cargo uh, transport. You would put energy production and distribution into these corridors. Uh, you build communication lines so that basically you would create uh, lo locations attractive for investment for middle level industry and agriculture and make the landlocked areas of Eurasia as attractive as previously only ports and cities along rivers and oceans. Now, when we proposed this for the first time in uh, 89 and 90, it was only an idea. We have campaigned for this proposal uh, in the last uh, 22 years. We had had hundreds of conferences and seminars in Moscow, Beijing, New Delhi, uh, all over Latin America, North America, Western Europe. And if you look what the present policies is of uh, Russia, of China, of Korea, they are building many of the projects which we had proposed 20 years ago. Now, uh, this is what we have to put on the table. We should uh, build the Eurasian land bridge, uh, connecting, for example, the far away Russian ports of Vladivostok, of the uh, Bering Strait, connection through the Trans-Siberian Railroad all the way to Lissabon through a maglev train. Uh, and that maglev train uh, corridor should then be the uh, connection through the Strait of Gibraltar to Africa. Uh, if you look at Spain and Portugal right now, there is very little industry, there is very little uh, you know, actual development, but if you look at the southern European countries, Greece, southern Italy, Spain, and Portugal, uh, if you had a Marshall Plan where the Eurasian land bridge is coming through the Balkans, rail lines to Greece, high-speed rail lines, right now Greece is not connected to any rail to Europe or to Asia because of the EU austerity policies, this has been cut. So you would take the Russian-Chinese motion towards Greece, build railways, uh, <clears throat> the same you would do through the southern part of Italy, build a bridge or a tunnel from Sicily to Tunisia, uh, and then have another corridor from uh, the Middle East through Egypt into Africa. Now, the only way how we can solve this problem, we need to have a Marshall Plan for Southern Europe, um, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, but use that development as a springboard for the development of the Middle East. If we do not develop new water resources in the Middle East and have real economic development, there will be never peace uh, in this region. But that should be then again the springboard for a Mediterranean uh, development program all around the Mediterranean and a true infrastructure development plan for Africa. In the Canary Island, you have every day or every week people you know, coming on the shore, having drowned by trying to escape from, Af from the African continent. Uh, the EU coastal guards are trying to drive these refugees back and prevent them from entering Spain or uh, Portugal or Greece or Malta. I mean, that's brutal, it's disgusting, and it is no solution. We have to bring the development to Africa. 
This is very easy. It would be so easy with existing technologies to make an infrastructure program for the entire African continent, to build ports, to build uh, an inter-African connected infrastructure system with high-speed rail uh, river systems to have the water from the Congo through a river and canal system being brought up to Lake Chad, uh, which right now is, has uh, dried out up to 10% of its original size, fill it up, use that water, which is now uh, going unused from the Congo region into the Atlantic uh, Ocean, and use that water in the entire sub-Sahara sub uh, region to turn it into uh, you know, gardens, woods, agricultural land, and transform the continent of Africa. All of this is possible. Now, I want to put this on the agenda because we have only two choices. If this financial crisis is not being stopped, the danger is that the forces who realize that their banking system is collapsing will resort to war. Right now, we are sitting on a powder keg. There is an immediate danger that if there are military actions against Syria, or Iran, this could in no time lead to a war against Russia and China. In this case, thermonuclear weapons would be used, and we are looking at the end of civilization. Now, that is a danger which is very much in the minds of the American military, who have come out warning against that. It's in the mind of the Israeli military. Uh, who have said that if it would come to such a war, it would destroy the region for 100 years to come. But that is probably an underestimation uh, of the century. So we are looking at a policy which, if it's continued, can only lead to war and destruction. There is no alternative. Uh, we have worked not only on the Eurasian land bridge, but we have, in the meantime, uh, you know, uh, developed that to be the world land bridge program of the reconstruction of the world economy. Now, in America, there is right now a total crisis, but there is also a tremendous drive for a reconstruction. The focus of this is the largest infrastructure program in history ever. It's uh, probably 50 times as big as the TVA program of Franklin D. Roosevelt. It's called the North America Water Management Alliance Program. Uh, and it's the idea to bring enormous amounts of water from Alaska and Canada along the Rocky Mountains all the way to Mexico, and to use that water development for the uh, development of agriculture, but also you know, a complete uh, improving of the biosphere uh, by having new water, uh, new weather systems, new rainfalls. It's a complete uh, effort to uh, green the desert, uh, basically uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. Now, that gigantic water project would be combined with the idea of developing the Bering Strait, the tunnel between Alaska and Siberia. When President Putin comes into office beginning of May, uh, this will be on the agenda because he has already declared that the Bering Strait Tunnel will be built, and that is an integral part to the development of the uh, far east of Russia, the Arctic region, where you find all raw materials and elements which are in the Mendeleev periodic system. Uh, there is a gigantic potential to use the development of the Arctic as the stepping stone for uh, meant space travel because many of the challenges uh, are going in the same direction. If we combine that momentum with the building of the Eurasian land bridge and basically say this old system is hopelessly bankrupt and we have to have a new plan for reconstruction, uh, then there is absolutely hope. Uh, Spain should do a science driver project, rather than allowing that all the scientists and the young people are leaving out of desperation, uh, you have to agree on one large development program, high science, high energy flux density program, to repa repatriate all the scientists abroad. Uh, Spain is capable to produce high speed, speed railway. 
uh, there was just an agreement to build a high-speed rail system in Wisconsin in the United States through a Spanish firm. Now, unfortunately, the governor of Wisconsin basically nixed that program, uh, which is a stupidity of the first uh, degree. But why should Spain only build high-speed railway in Wisconsin? I think you need to have high-speed rail connection uh, between the Ibero Peninsula and the rest of the Eurasian land bridge. If we build a trans-rapid uh, rap maglev train from the Bering Strait all the way to Lisbon, it's only a mere 450 billion euro. Now, that has been wasted on the bankrupt banks several times, but if you build, build a trans-rapid uh, tra trans maglev train from the Bering Strait to Lisbon, that could be the uh, one project which would create many, many jobs, and it would be the beginning of a complete transformation uh, of uh, all of Eurasia. There are similar projects which have to be defined. Well, I think we are at a crossroad. Mankind has reached a point where if we continue with this policy of globalization, the policy of empire, the policy of geostrategic conflict, we will probably lead to our own destruction in either a thermonuclear war or you know, we will destroy the economic basis up to a point where billions of people are not going to make it. But the human being is a creative human being. We are the only species which can willfully change the order of their existence. We have the creative powers, we have the free will, and we have proven many times in the history of universal history that if man so wills, you can end a dark age and you can start a renaissance period. Now, I want to invite you into a dialogue to do that because you have right now a growing opposition against the present policies in all European countries. You have a motion for Klaus Stiegel, but we need to discuss are we as mankind fit to give ourselves a government which takes care of the well-being of its people? And I think, yes, we should discuss it and we should do it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Helga, for this fantastic presentation. We got already uh, several questions in from all over the world. Uh, I want to start with a question from a youth in Murcia in Spain. Uh, he says, I have a general question which somewhat typifies the thinking prevalent among the youth of my generation. I am 32 years old, born in Spain, with a higher level education and fairly great creative potential, limited by the, cogn uh, by the cognitively and emotionally repressed and destructive education which I have received since my life's journey began, like the majority of the youth of this country. I have just learned that the perception um, of reality which I had of the world which surrounds me and in which I find myself immersed has been completely distorted, preventing me from developing as an independent individual with unlimited powers, with criteria totally different from other, from other individuals, in other words, with freedom. Many of the proposals which your group puts forward as solutions to financial disintegration are very logical and pretty coherent. Glass-Steagall, credit systems and the rest. But don't you think we are recreating the same circumstances as the 1929 Great Depression, recreating the same mechanism and roles of the time? If the great controlling system of British imperialism is the same, what is the point of fighting against it if we do not end up overthrowing it? In other words, why won't you end up with a set of destructive values and customs, religious, monetary, political, philosophical, which will recreate the same circumstances time and time again throughout, uh, I'm sorry, which will recreate uh, the same circumstances uh, time and time again throughout generations keeping them self-perpetuating in power. I could be being ingenious, but is it this difficult?
Well, I think that the um, present empire is in its last moments, and that is what makes it so dangerous. But when this banking system uh, is uh, reorganized through a class legal reorganization, it means that Wall Street and the city of London in the large part will vanish or they will go bankrupt. As a matter of fact, there is right now, even in Great Britain, a discussion that it was a mistake for uh, Great Britain to almost entirely rely on the financial industry, which obviously is a joke in itself because it's a contradiction. There is no industry. But people realized that it was a mistake to entirely depend on speculative activities. And there is a discussion how to recreate the British economy. Now, I think that a lot of this uh, changes you know, has to come from the population. Uh, you have right now uh, a lot of good people, and I know that because we are organizing in many countries in the world, and the biggest problem is that the many, many good people are not united. You have people who are decent human beings, but they don't know of each other. There are groups of people who are fighting for aspects of what we are talking about, but they are not connected. And I think that the big challenge uh, in the next days and weeks and hopefully months uh, will be to make sure that this alternative is available in the knowledge of the masses of the population. Now, I know a couple of things I'm not at liberty to tell you, uh, which make me a little bit more optimistic that this can be done. If, for example, all over the world, people who are right now realizing that this system is killing people, who realize that the economy is collapsing, trade unionists who realize, I mean, look at what is happening. You, I mean, the thing which is so mind boggling, I mean, I'm a European, but I'm not a European Union European. Why not? Because with the EU right now, every civil right, every labor right, which has been fought for, for centuries, is being thrown out of the window. Sovereignty, uh, the participation of the individual in government, tarifabschlüsse, uh, 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 trade union negotiation, all of this is thrown out of the window and people are not making it an issue. Uh, the lo total, why, why make, make, do people make a fuss about the so-called lack of democracy and human rights in Russia or China when the EU and the United States for that matter are right now eliminating even the pretext of civil liberties, of democracy, of a due process in parliament. Uh, so this is all uh, going on. But it is not that people don't notice it. It's just that they are not organized. And I think that if we move right now, where the breakdown of the system is becoming more apparent, to make sure that the whole world, every country, every people on the planet, every group knows about the fact that there is a reconstruction plan, and a clear alternative to the present failed system, uh, then I think we can pull it off. As I said, I know of organizing activities which are really impressive. They are being advanced with a lot of enthusiasm right now, and you will hear about it fairly soon. And I have um, a basic reason for, for this optimistic view, because you see, the, the present monetary system and the present political structures of the so-called globalization they assume a world, uh, an, an image of man, which do really not exist, because they assume that a small privileged elite can rule over masses of ignorant people, of people who are kept deliberately ignorant, and that you know the, the, that is in a fixed universe, like the Club of Rome wants to come out beginning of May uh, with another atrocity calling for a total shrinkage of the world population, a shrinkage of the world economy, with the absurd argument that the peak of world development has long been surpassed. 
Now that is absurd because if you look at the world as it really is, we, we with our small planet Earth are not in a vacuum somewhere in the universe, but we are part of a developing galaxy. Our galaxy is only one of billions of galaxies. All of these galaxies uh, continue to, to expand. There is a continuous increase of energy flux density in the universe at large. And, you know, man has a very specific role in this universe. We are not you know, we maybe not be the only intelligent species. We haven't found the other ones, but we right now are special in this universe. Uh, you can discuss it in theological terms, like Nicholas of Cusa, uh, who basically said that the only reason why man can know anything about the laws of the universe is because the laws of the microcosm, the creative reason, are in cohesion with the laws of the macrocosm the universe at large. So I think we have reached a point now, it's like when you look at the Middle Ages, the 14th century, which was a dark age, but then you had a couple of individuals like Nicholas of Cusa, uh, the Council of Florence, uh, the various people around, you know, <coughs> Petrarca, in the footsteps of Petrarca around uh, the Council of Florence who brought in Plato into the discussion you had the absolute explosion of the Italian Renaissance. And that was the beginning of modern times. And we are now at a point exactly like that. If we stick with the oligarchical system, we will not make it as a civilization. We will be as dis extinct as the dinosaurs were 65 million years ago. Uh, the dinosaurs could not make the jump because they had a huge body they had a very small head, an even smaller brain, and they had to eat the whole day to keep alive. Now, we are today in a situation where mankind is in a similar condition. If we stick with the oligarchy, if we stick with the system of empire, we are not going to survive. But I believe that man is completely different from all other living uh, species by being capable of creative reason, by being able to write poetry, to compose beautiful classical music, to discover scientific principles, you know, of an ever more astounding uh, depths and, and profundity. And why should we not be able to put this entire era of colonialism, of imperialism, of oligarchism behind us and start to create a world which is truly worthy of the dignity of all human beings on this planet. Why should we not be able to form an alliance of sovereign nation states which can peacefully work together for the common aims of mankind? Why should we not be able to stop thinking about greed, money, uh, you know, entertainment in stupid pleasures? And why should we not be at the air beginning of an era where people find the fulfillment of their life in becoming creative, in becoming a composer of great music, in becoming a breakthrough scientist, in becoming somebody who has a fulfilled life because he devotes his or her life to the continuation of the long chain of generations where each generation gives something more rich to the next generation. And why should we not you know, find the meaning of our life in making mankind more noble with what we do. And I think that that is the true nature of mankind. And if that is the spirit of the reconstruction of the economy, if we combine the reconstruction of the economy with the idea of a cultural renaissance, well, I think then we have a fantastic future and we will be within the laws of the universe at large. And I think that's a winning perspective. I have two other questions uh, from Spain. The first one, the first one from uh, Cantabria. Uh, hello to everyone, and especially to Mrs. Helga Zeppler Rouge. It is known that the possible bankruptcy of Spain and following bailout will make it impossible for the euro system to continue, and in chain reaction, 
the rest of the international financial and economic system based on monetarism, as Lyndon LaRouche has repeatedly explained. As he has also emphasized without throwing Obama out of the office of the U.S. presidency and restoring Glass-Steagall, it is practically impossible to arrive at a solution to the crisis today, which brings with it also the probability of thermonuclear world, uh, world war. Therefore, given the situation, in what degree could stopping the fall of Spain prevent the outcome of a Europe and therefore the entire world sunk in economic depression? And if this is possible, how could we put together a change in government in Spain which would have such broad-reaching consequences both on the European policy developed in Brussels and on the policies of Washington, D.C. Could a sufficiently broad citizens' movement, I'm speaking of a million of mobilized people, bring about a political change in Spain which would have international consequences? If we do not achieve this now, are we irreversibly headed into a new dark age? Thank you. And the second uh, question from Spain, uh, which is you know, also pretty European in its characteristic, it just asks, will the masters of the systems allow this to be carried out, th the replacement of the system? Well, naturally, their inclination uh, to answer the second question will be to try not to allow it, but I mean, if you look at the EU, for example, they have contingency plans uh, for the collapse of the euro, that there will be social upheavals, they have maps where the riots are expected. The British government was so cynical to have the proposal to have, uh, you know, <clears throat> to, to um, ship their British subjects from the continent to Great Britain in case the euro collapses because they expect that the banks will shut down, there will be no more money machines to get money from. This is all totally ridiculous and this could happen. I mean, we are on, sitting on a powder keg. If you look back what happened in Albania in 1997 when the pyramid schemes which they had imposed from the government together with the IMF, by the way, uh, where all the Albanians had put their savings in and were promised two-digit profits. Uh, when that thing collapsed, uh, you had a complete shutdown of society. Uh, people were storming food stores. They were storming weapon depots. You could see six-year-old people, uh, boys and girls, running around with Kalashnikovs, the police and the uh, army uh, also robbed the, the food stores because they wanted to eat. Now that could happen. Um, and there is no army in the world with which you could stop that because armies also want to eat. You know, and obviously, you know, if there would be such an uncontrolled collapse, uh, you know, it, it would be a catastrophe. Now, obviously, this will happen one way or another if you either have uh, more uh, economic uh, breakdown, an uncontrolled collapse of the banking system, or hyperinflation. But it doesn't have to happen, because if we have now uh, a discussion, what is the economic reconstruction program for Spain and Portugal? As I said, in the context of a Marshall Plan for all the southern European states. Now, at this point, you know, Greece, for example, has almost zero high-tech project. Southern Italy is notorious of being completely like a third world country. The Mezzogiorno has never seen any industrial development. Large parts of Spain are pretty much undeveloped. Uh, the same goes for Portugal. So the first thing you need to do is you have to have some kind of infrastructure uh, modern infrastructure, very advisable, is Maglev, for example. Uh, in the case of port, in, in, in the case of Greece, uh, you could build ports like Piraeus uh, as a hub for the uh, transport to all of the Balkans, to all of Eastern Europe, uh, for Russia, for uh, Western Europe. 
and as a transport line to Western Europe. And you could then define uh, certain key projects uh, which would be science driver projects. The same thing for Spain. If you look at Spain as the Ibero Peninsula, you know, and nothing follows that, well, it's sort of the end of Europe. But if you think about that, the historic mission of all of Europe would be the development of Africa. Now, I say since a very long time that in order for Europe to hold together, we do not need a supranational structure, which is in total alienation. You know, we have a supra supranational structure of bureaucrats, and you have masses of population which are miserable, miserable, and who feel not represented. Uh, we could have an alliance of sovereign republics, of fatherlands, like the de Gaulle idea of an alliance of the fatherlands, who would adopt as a joint mission the development of the African continent. Now, if Europe is not able to develop Africa, a continent which is potentially so rich, uh, for example, take Sudan. Sudan, uh, you know, right now, it's uh, in serious problems. You have areas where you have starvation, you have civil war between the South and the North. Uh, the economic condition is terrible. But if, for example, uh, the European nations, Portugal, Spain, uh, <clears throat> uh, Greece, together with Germany, France, would decide, let's develop the entire South African, uh, the uh, entire African continent. Sudan alone uh, has soil, which is probably the richest in the world. If you would have infrastructure, uh, irrigation, so that you would take that part of the agriculture, which is only uh, you know, due uh, to or uh, dependent on the rainfall, and you would, for example, tap either into the large lakes in the underground, or you would use the Katara depression from the Mediterranean to bring water and you know, basically desalinate that water to irrigate uh, large parts of this region south of Libya uh, in northern Sudan. Sudan could become the breadbasket for not only Africa, but for large part of the world. You have riches which are totally undeveloped and building new cities, building new universities. Why should we not uh, build new cities? The Sahara, rather than covering it with uh, desert tech uh, solar panels, which will make sure that never ever one little green grass will ever grow there, uh, why not uh, use the irrigation uh, projects like the Transaqua project to bring the water from Congo to Lake Chad, combine that with the five uh, Nile uh, neighbor countries along the White and the Blue Nile uh, to develop this whole region. We could, we could give Europe a mission to uplift Africa from starvation and poverty and disease and have a mission. You know, Europe doesn't have to be uh, a parasite, you know, looting the rest of the world, but we could use the incredible heritage we have. I mean, look at Spain. Spain has a, a long tradition of the Andalusian uh, contribution to European. Without the Andalusian uh, Renaissance, probably much of the knowledge from the uh, Islamic Renaissance, from the Abbasid dynasty, would never have been carried back to Europe. Then Spain has uh, an enormous uh, rich Alfonso the Wise, Carlos the Third. There were periods in the Spanish history which showed the promise. Spain had a tremendous role in liberating Europe from Napoleon. The, when Napoleon wanted to have a world empire and had occupied almost everything in Europe already. He was planning to go further on to Russia, to Egypt. From Russia, he wanted to go to India. He wanted to have a world empire. Now, where did the rebellion against Napoleon start? It started in Spain. And when that resistance against the Napoleonic occupation uh, came, all the Republicans and all the humanists from Germany looked at Spain for leadership. Freiherr von Stein was waiting. How did the Spanish rebellion against Napoleon uh, develop to then, you know, basically further the resistance in Germany? 
So I think what you need to do is go back to the brightest moments uh, in your history and basically say, we will not be a people of slaves, but we will design uh, in the context of the world land bridge reconstruction, uh, some high speed uh, infrastructure projects, some high energy flux density uh, energy production. We will build some new city as a science city. We repatriate all the scientists and students who have left. We give an incentive so that they come back to build our country. And there is no reason why that cannot become the subject of a broad citizens movement. People demonstrate for all kinds of things, but I think what we need very quickly is to say that we are at an absolute beginning of a new era. And it is to a very large extent in our hands if that will be the beginning of the end of civilization, the beginning of a collapse in a dark age, or indeed what I call the era of adulthood of mankind. <clears throat> Since we get so many questions in, I have to <clears throat> group them somehow. Uh, another question is now from Ireland, from our dear friend Jean Douglas uh, for the La Rouge Irish uh, Brigade. Uh, and he writes, Dear Helga, as we organize for our NO vote in the austerity treaty referendum in Ireland on May 31st, a key point that we continue to emphasize is that by achieving such an outcome, we could be striking a major blow, not only for the citizens of Ireland, but for our brothers and sisters in Spain, Portugal, Greece, Italy, and throughout Europe, and indeed beyond Europe, who are under the yoke of this oligarchical financial empire. Sinn Féin and the labor unions in Ireland have also hammered this point home with strongly worded statements issued in recent days. The result of the first round in the French presidential election and the ongoing opposition to Merkel in Germany point to the fact that all the people of Europe, even those who are not presently on the chopping block, detest the austerity policies being presented and think that they can only bring further economic and social misery. However, most still talk of returning to the markets to borrow for economic investments, etc., under some kind of revised system. They don't seem to understand that the whole transatlantic system is totally bankrupt. You have made this clear many times, but I would like to ask you to clarify it once again in the context of the current fight. Many thanks, Jean Douglas. Um, there's another question, says Mrs. Uh, LaRouche. What can you tell us about the recent presidential campaign in France of your friend Jacques Geminat and its significance for Europe? Well, I'm very happy um, about the referendum in Ireland because <clears throat> uh, it is actually such a subject, you know, like the euro, uh, the question of a European government, a European economic government, that it's almost unconceivable how anybody can think that they can decide such big issues over the heads of their citizens. So therefore, the fact that there is a referendum in Ireland is very good because it inspires uh, all the people in all the other countries to demand a referendum themselves. Now, it is funny because in Germany, for example, uh, according to the uh, Constitution, the Grundgesetz, at Article 146, uh, when you change the Constitution, uh, i.e. when you give up sovereignty and transfer it to a supranational institution like the EU Commission, uh, it requires a referendum. Now the problem is that obviously the powers to be never thought that there should be a referendum and therefore there is no legislation. Uh, so it's not clear if you come to a point where a referendum should be held who should call for it? Should it be the parliament? They will not do it because they want to prevent that from happening. 
should it be the people? Yeah, but how do the people do it just by collecting signatures? So, but this is right now in Germany, a very, very explosive question. And, um, you know, we had a intervention in a meeting with the head of the Constitutional Court a couple of days ago in uh, Stuttgart, and we were asking uh, him, uh, what about a referendum? How do you get there? And he said, and I, I think this is very interesting, that there is such a broad demand uh, that that decision may come more quickly than people think. And indeed, you have right now mushrooming of citizens' initiative, of groups against the ESM every, in every country. You have a tremendous motion in Germany. It's not so much publicized, but it is there. You have it in Austria. Uh, you know, governments are falling. The Dutch government just fell over that question. Uh, today is a referendum, uh, uh, or no, a mistrust vote in the Czech parliament against the austerity policy. So you have a lot of motion right now. And I think that what we need to demand is simply a referendum. If you have a, a, a such an incredible situation like right now in, in Germany, a continuous permanent bailout mechanism on the expense of the citizens. Should the citizens not be asked if they want that or not? So I have demanded for Germany uh, an absolute uh, demand for a referendum uh, immediately combined with the referendum over the euro, the question of returning to the sovereign control of your own currency, uh, combined with Klaus Diegel, combined with a credit system with fixed exchange rates, and naturally then uh, we have to go in the direction of the reconstruction of the world land bridge. So I think we need to have that debate. And I think uh, Jacques' uh, presidential campaign in France has uh, really gotten us a huge step ahead because Jacques Cheminat is now a household word, word in France uh, he has brought up the Klaus Stiegel debate, which, you know, a couple of two years ago, nobody knew in Europe what Klaus Stiegel is. Now everybody talks about it. Most people don't know exactly what it is, but, you know, the word is being spread, is being spread. Uh, he has introduced the issue of space travel, the importance of space development, uh, the development of uh, <clears throat> uh, the Arctic and similar questions. And he is now launching a campaign to have 100 candidates participating in the parliament elections in June. Uh, and I think we should do something similar. I would like to encourage people who are watching today and who are in discussion uh, to think of setting up a serious movement in Spain and in Portugal uh, of people who are spreading these ideas of uh, Lyndon LaRouche, of the Schiller Institute, I don't care how you call it, but to dis make sure that everybody knows uh, about this perspective of a development plan for the Ibero uh, Peninsula as a springboard for the Mediterranean development, for the Middle East, for Africa. And I think, you know, if then the next time the trade unions are opposing the cuts, if the scientists are opposing the emigration and the brain drain, rather than just being against something, that they can come forward and say, we demand Klaus Stiegel, we demand uh, a world land bridge, we, we demand the you know, Marshall Plan for, for Southern Europe. And then this fight has a totally different character. So I think we are in a tremendously important moment of history, but we must seize it. It is extremely urgent. The next question is coming from Portugal, uh, from a young uh, engineer in Porto Alegre. <coughs> uh, excuse me. He asks, I say that large parts of Portugal and Spain have not been developed, mostly because of our very own oligarchy and large landowners. It is said that in Portugal that no real change can occur in southern Portugal and Spain without a large land reform. Does Iberia have the ability to be a small-scale Nawapa? How could this be connected to a bridge to Gibraltar? Um, 
<clears throat> well, I think that the the first uh, the first thing to start with is let's get together groups of engineers, groups of scientists, groups of su students in the field of natural science, and let's work out a plan. As I said, we have the basic idea of you know, taking the Eurasian land bridge, which we have published many reports about since 1990, uh, but they need to be filled out. We have developed a, a, a plan for the development of Africa for the first time in 1976. We have added many uh, subsequent reports to it. Some are more developed, some are less developed. So the overall idea is very clear. We need to have, starting with infrastructure, because without modern infrastructure, without an integrated system of fast, high-speed railway, autobahn, river systems, canal systems, without that you cannot develop anything. Even if you have the most beautiful agricultural development, and if you have no infrastructure, then the agricultural pro produce rots and doesn't go anywhere. So you need infrastructure, you need to develop Africa, uh, agriculture, fishing, uh, you need food processing, all of these things. And then, as I said, you need to adopt a couple, at least one or two high technology science driver projects which have to be big enough so that they get the productivity level of the economy uh, in general upgraded. And for the specifics for uh, Spain and Portugal, I would elicit your cooperation to pick such projects. As I said, the railway uh, from the Bering Strait to Lisbon through Gibraltar, that is an obvious connection. And with a big project like that, you don't have to build it at once. You can start it in different sections to connect it. Now, the question obviously is you have to uh, focus on those areas of the industry where you get a relatively short term increase in productivity, like, you know, making agriculture more productive, making uh, fish farming and, and similar things. Uh, but then you have to adopt a, a couple of science driver things because if you don't upgrade the general productivity of the population, uh, the problem cannot be solved. On land reform, I would say that once you have a developed program for all, uh, Southern Europe, including the Mediterranean, including the Middle East, because this region really sh should be looked at as one region, including as northern at northern Africa and Africa at large, then you know I mean you can simply put it in such a way that either these landowners cooperate, because you know at least in the German constitution there is also a law which says that uh, possession obliges. You cannot just possess things, but you have to make these possessions to you to to service the common good. Now, you would want these people to, you know, maybe say, I can uh, stop to be an oligarch and I can contribute to the common good, and that way I'll be part of the human race in the coming epoch. Or, you know, if they don't want to do that, then, you know, maybe you have to have a democratic vote and decide differently. But I think the driver has to be the vision. You know, if you have a vision where you want to go, then you can move mountains literally you can excite people you can get the momentum on your side and then what you do then with the actual possession of the land could be solved democratically it could be solved voluntarily or you just say the state has to decide what is good for the common good of the people and then some other accommodation has to be found but i think start with the vision start with the program recruit young people to fight for your country to fight for your future and then it can be solved yeah i have here a kind of a follow up question an economist who collaborates with the la rouge movement in spain writes uh, from barcelona Hegger asked for collaboration from Spain, and to that I write. I think practical measures are needed, such as prohibiting earning interest on money by law, 
Second, we must first leave Europe and the euro and return to printing pesetas with the value of a euro uh, with fixed exchange rates in the necessary amount to provide as much credit as the nation economy requires and create a single national bank. Then we can apply LaRouche's economic theory with these global projects and apply such latest scientific discoveries as burning seawater as a fuel substitute for petroleum. What do you think of these solutions? I fully endorse them. <laughs> um, I think we need to have a return to national currencies. And you know, even if there is a difficult period, once you have, re once you regain the sovereign control over the printing of your own currency, of the economic policy of your country, well, then you can allocate the resources in such a way that it serves the common good of the people. I mean, there are some examples where that was done recently. Look at Argentina. You know, Argentina uh, broke with the IMF, and they are doing much, much, much better. Look at Island. Uh, they basically choose the way to go their own in their own economic development. And the whole idea that, you know, once you break with the IMF uh, policy that you are no more credit worthy and all these catastrophes happen, it's not really true because, you know, there is right now a tremendous wish of many countries in the world to escape this utilitarian globalist system and credit arrangements can be made. All you need is to make credit arrangements with a couple of countries uh, for long-term development. Um, and then you have a credit system. You know That is actually what a new Bretton Woods system would become. You agree on certain investments, on joint projects, uh, joint ventures in third countries. For example, if you build high-speed railways in Africa, it cannot be done by one country alone. You may have, you know, maybe Spain has to build some train routes, high-speed rail routes. Uh, maybe uh, some countries have to come in the financing part. Some countries invest in the agriculture. The agriculture uh, investment is being paid back by food deliveries. Maybe you have to make a nested system of multinational trade relations over 25 to 50 years, you know, which may be totally new, maybe bring together new combinations. But as long as it is real uh, investment in the real economy and physical economy and follows the principles of physical economy, i.e. You, you only should give these credit lines for things which increase the productivity of the labor force and the industrial capacities. Uh, and for that, we have scientific criteria. Mr. LaRouche has developed that since many years, the whole idea of the increase of the relative potential population density, the focus on the increase of the high energy flux density. There are certain yardsticks which tell you exactly if an investment is uh, productive and, and positive or if it should not be done. So if somebody wants to come like Mr. Adelson and invest in casinos, you should say you are not welcomed here because this is not helping the, the uh, Spanish people. So please go elsewhere. Uh, if somebody comes and says, I want to invest in uh, basic uh, research in biophysics or other areas, then welcome such a person, give him a, a tax incentive. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, 10% of the economy should be basic research and development. If you do that, then you have uh, an absolute focus on what will lead to the increase of productivity for the future. So when you put together such investments, go for the maximum increase in the degrees of freedom uh, in the economy in terms of using the creative potential of your labor force and just get a general discussion. You know, what is the merit of physical economy. There is much too little discussion, you know, and for example, if you look of how did Germany develop from a feudal country to become an industrialized nation? That is a history which is unfortunately much too little known. But Bismarck, who used to be 
uh, a monetarist who believed in the feudal system, then through a variety of uh, coincidences came in contact with the economic theory of Henry Carey, who was the economic advisor of uh, Lincoln. And he got really converted from a free market uh, <clears throat> proponent into uh, somebody believing in the protectionist system into the Henry Carey uh, uh, economic system. And in a couple of years, Germany turned from a feudal country into one of the most industrialized nations in the world. And that history can be studied. There are other such examples, like the writings of Count Witte for Russia. Uh, how did the Meiji uh, restoration in, in Japan transform Japan from a feudal country into one of the industrialized nations? So there are many examples. And I think you should encourage uh, economic students uh, in Spain to forget the London School of Economics, to forget the free trade school, and go into some of the real economists from Leibniz, from uh, Friedrich List, Carey, you know, study, study those thinkers who actually were in the tradition of physical economy and get a public debate about that. Propose to the professors, you know, to reflect on the fact that the entire economic uh, branch of science doesn't look so good these days because they were completely off in predicting the crisis and they still be be believe in these statistical models and get the best of them excited to say, okay, there must be a revolution in economic science uh, and that is what will transform Spain. So I think we have many, many exciting things to do. So uh, I have two questions, uh, <clears throat> one from Chile and the other one from Brazil. I will summarize them somehow. Both send, uh, both are sending greetings and all their support. The from Chile, uh, they are asking how should we, and uh, in South America, all the other. Um, nations confront the crisis since we have so little scientific, technological and edu uh, educational development. Um, and they are further asking how should we start to guide the population uh, to make this change possible. And um, the one from Brazil is um, more or less asking what international body um, or which countries should um, implement these solutions you are proposing. Um, and they are also wondering um, what will happen to the debt uh, of the bankrupt countries uh, and also from you know, all the other countries of Asia, Latin America and Africa. Well, I think, um, you know, obviously when uh, you are in a country where the general scientific le level of, this, uh, of education is not yet so good, you have to start with those things which you have and, you know, get projects which, you know, like, for example, educate the people while they're doing the job. And again, infrastructure is a wonderful thing because, you know, if you think that the, uh, every time you build infrastructure, there are many accounts how the population is being transformed simply by the experience of building, uh, simply by saying that, uh, by seeing that there are completely new potentialities uh, developing. And, you know, I think that we have worked out a, a whole um, development perspective, the, uh, the South, Afri uh, South American part of the word land bridge, which I would advise you to look at. These are proposals which go back to uh, a plan my husband worked out in 82 together with Lopez Portillo. It was called Operation Juarez. It was the idea to integrate the entire Latin American continent 
through infrastructure. In a certain sense, this is even more easy than Europe because you have only two languages, Spanish and Portuguese, and therefore the language problem is not such a dividing uh, question like we have it in Europe. This operation, Juarez, was the idea that if you look at the map of Latin America or Africa for that matter, you see that there is no connected infrastructure network. You can go from a certain place to the port, uh, but you cannot go from west to the east or from the north to the south by railway, for example. This is a relic of the colonial powers who had no interest to have an intercontinental infrastructure development, but who only built short strips of infrastructure to exploit the raw materials. So the first step would be to look at this Operation Juarez and the updated version, uh, what we have produced about a year ago, uh, and then get the same kind of movement going uh, like we are trying to build it uh, in Europe right now or in, in, the, in North America for the Navapa project. Um, and then simply, you know, get people interested in it. And, you know, we are at the verge of the collapse of the system. And therefore, you know, the readiness to discuss alternatives is going to be uh, much uh, stronger uh, than it, it is normally in, in normal times. Now, international bodies to implement that, I do not really see right now. That doesn't mean that you could not interest places like Mercosur uh, or other subgroups uh, to go with these programs. I'm not excluding that. But I, I can tell you that right now, there are a couple of countries which are absolutely going in this direction. Um, for example, Russia. Uh, is definitely committed to build uh, new cosmodromes for space travel, to build Arctic cities, like for example, they want to build the city Umka in the Arctic, which is a very inspiring idea. It's like the idea you have in the Arctic under permafrost conditions. You build a city which is under a roof and completely uh, you know, separated from the Arctic uh, environment. You have like a city for 5,000 people. Uh, you have the agriculture inside. Uh, you use hydroponic and other methods. You have gardens and flowers. Everything is inside. So you have a mini, like a, a, a space station, like the ISS space station, but larger. And by building such a city, you, you experiment and test on the Earth of what it would require to build similar cities on the Moon, on the Mars, and maybe beyond that. So it is like the next frontier of development, and Russia is totally committed to that. China wants to become the leading space power of the world, I think uh, very ambitiously, until the year 2040 or so very soon in the future. They want to mine helium, helium-3 on the moon, which will be the fuel for thermonuclear uh, fusion as a fuel for space rockets. Uh, the Chinese are totally determined, you know, to become the leading science power in the world. And they have long-term cooperation agreements between Russia and China uh, for this purpose. South Korea is one of the nations which is becoming a model for many countries in Africa. Uh, they want to build 98 nuclear power stations until, I think, 2030. 80 for export and 18 for domestic consumption. Uh, as I said, there are several African countries who look at South Korea as one of the countries which has been very intelligently you know, bypassing all the global structures and, you know, becoming really a modernized nation. And South Korea is also a country which has very high esteem for classical music. And I think this is very important for the morale uh, of the population. So I think there is hope. Uh, I think that, you know, we are at a point where if we get any momentum in the transatlantic world for this development, we already have partners, Russia, China, other nations, Argentina, uh, 
and you know we can move to form an alliance of sovereign republics you know we have we don't have to be at each other's throats i think the the level of mankind's development has reached where either we stop to think in geostrategic terms and we concentrate on the common aims of mankind you know and then we become adult human beings and i think this is one of the most exciting moments to consciously say we will now make the next step in human evolution by stopping to be you know of this people who believe in war as a means of settling conflict and we can you know totally define the future as a vision like poets who have a beautiful vision about the future and then act to make it in reality let the future determine the present by having beautiful concepts of how mankind can become and how we can organize our life and that of our planet and our planet in the context of the solar system and then we can do everything we can do miracles i believe that the human creativity has only been that much developed we are embryos in terms of creativity if we would all develop our full potential as human beings there is absolutely many many beautiful things to discover where our power of imagination needs a lot of training to even imagine what they can be i have another question from uh, spain um I have been following LPEC reports from Barcelona closely for some time, although only recently have I begun to understand certain questions related to the U.S. constitutional credit system and the international monetary system. I would like to ask you if it is possible to implement reforms in the European Union along the lines of the American credit system, even though it would be a third part of the public deficit and keeping the euro. In that way, we would recover national sovereignty over currency from the supranational monetarist European credit system, which in the end does not function. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I think the euro is an, something we have to get rid of. I, I cannot see how one can make the euro function uh, simply because you cannot have you know in, it's not like the united states there will be never a united states of europe uh, simply because europe consists out of different nations presently it's 27 different nations different languages different histories different cultures and you know the effort to make esperanto didn't function, the effort to make it one culture doesn't function, and you know it shouldn't function because, you know, I mean, first of all, national sovereignty of the nation state, where one country has one na national language, national culture, is an enrichment. It would be terrible if we only had one language on the globe. I think we would lose all the many expressions of poetry of lyrical beauty of you know specificity you know i see the the combination of nations it's like different pearls on a on a crown uh, each one contributes something unique and beautiful and i i don't think you can make all of this into one uh, you know one unified world currency or a euro which is a sub world currency so I think we need to go back to national currency. Uh, I think this will come. I think Greece will have no other choice than doing it soon because when the new government comes in uh, after the May election, the demands by the European Union to impose even more brutal austerity will be absolutely certain. And we are talking to people in Greece who told us that they think that if the new government is going with austerity, they will be very short-lived because the desperation is becoming just too big. Um, I think the question of Spain remaining in the euro will become a question of impossibility because you know, if you have to pay higher and higher interest rate for credits, 
you know, the you can squeeze a lemon, but there comes the point where the lemon is 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 empty. So you need to go back to sovereign control over the currency, and the question of a credit system. I think that that is something you have to. We all have to start seriously debating. Because obviously the only people who do not like that idea are those people who have all this virtual money accumulated and they say, ah, oh, but we have these titles, we have these structured papers, we have these derivatives, we have all of these things. But in reality, these things are virtual. They don't exist. And all you have to do is to take in the computer the delete button and all of this virtual money disappears and you have not lost anything because you never possessed it in the first place. Now, some people have a hard time to accept that because they think that all their Porsches and caviar uh, snacks and whatnot is all dependent on this virtual money. They may have to readjust and just become normal human beings like everybody else, and they may not like it. But you know, I think that if we get the majority of people to say, what do people really care about? People care about having a life. People care about having a job. People care about having their life work, you know, somehow valued in the form of a pension when they get old. They want to have health care. They want to have schools. And people who are not moral morons, they want to have a better life for their children than what they had. That was what morality used to be, that you live and you do things so that your children have a better life. Now, there are polls right now where in Europe, and I think in the United States, it's the f same thing, where we have the first time a situation where old and young people think that the young generation will have it much worse than the previous, gen previous generation. Now, isn't that terrible? I mean, that breeds pessimism, cultural pessimism, and cultural pessimism breeds fascist ideas. Uh, so I think what we need to do is we have to go back to the idea that it is the normal people who have a right to have a worthy life, to have a living standard which allows them to be creative, to study things, to not be completely slaves uh, to, to some useless, uh, unproductive job, to have a perspective of improving, to continue to learn even when you are 90, you know, when you are 100, you should learn a language you didn't know before. There should be a continuous progression in your own life and in that of your nation. And I think, I think people had it with this present globalization. People can't stand bankers anymore who fill their pockets with boni of two digit million uh, or more per year. People had it with this, the destruction of everything they used to know. And I think we are right at the moment where people can start the kind of discussion which existed in the Young America with the Federalist Paper. Uh, the idea of what does it require that we can govern ourselves? Uh, what kind of government do we need? Do we want a representative system of government? What does it mean to get people who are now other directed to become true state citizens? How can we inspire our young people to leave dope, to leave violent video games, and study and make something out of their mind. And I think if we have a couple of examples of people who are doing it, and have some people understanding that this is one of these moments in history where you can totally mold a period, that we can get the excitement of people to join such a movement for the next level of the development of civilization. And I think it doesn't go with any smaller idea, but we are in a crisis of civilization as a totality, and we only will get out of it if we have such a universal perspective. All right, so we are getting close uh, to the end, and um, I, I will promise we will get to those questions that we couldn't address uh, within this discussion. Uh, so I want to get to the, the last questions. Um, I have to summarize them somehow. We had, um, we are 
having students in Valencia, uh, Valencia uh, who are participating and um, they expressed um, a question which was has had a uh, yeah, similar characteristic to a lot of other questions coming in. Um, basically, how uh, yeah, how we how we can get around uh, the party structure and get people mobilized for this uh, change. And um, the other one, uh, it is also from Spain, where it is basically saying. We are in a period of history in which we can say that the earth and nowhere else is our home. This requires that we change our mentality to be open and accept each other as part of mankind. My question is, how can each person individually preserve their culture and also change the world? Well, the party structure is really the um, the grave of um, civilized world because you can you can see that uh, when when the political expression is reduced to a party structure within the parliamentarian system, the ability of the individual to participate is really going towards zero. Uh, t take Germany for example; you have uh, the party structure. Uh, where now they want to eliminate the uh, right of the individual parliamentarian to speak in the parliament if he is not chosen by the faction uh, to do so. In other words, dissidents no longer are supposed to be able to speak. Uh, they also want to close the loophole of individual citizens being able to go to the constitutional court to make a complaint on constitutional issues. So you see that there is with the EU development, with the Lisbon Treaty, and naturally especially with the ESM, there is a tendency towards dictatorship in Europe, and that is a very acute and real danger. So I think what you need is a resistance movement. Um, you know, the parties, at least most parties, are the slaves of the banking system. The fact that this is so, you can see by the fact that in the Almost five years since the breakout of the financial crisis, uh, there has been nothing to re-regulate uh, the banking system. There has been one bailout program after the other. And the governments made up by parties, and in many cases also the opposition parties, have proven to be just the uh, organs of the financial sector at the disinterest of the population. So if that is the case, then obviously we need something else. And I think that what we need right now is the idea of a resistance movement. Uh, we, for example, have started uh, to play around with the idea in Germany of producing a button uh, basically on a blue ground, just a white rose, no text. Uh, and the few times we have distributed this button, people said, yes, I'm going to carry that. And actually, it's a reference to the uh, white rose resistance uh, in Germany during the Nazi period. Now, maybe you find something similar. Uh, I mean, the idea came about because there was this Roman senator who told another Roman senator, maybe we should uh, make all the slaves carry signs so that we know who is a slave and who not. And then the other senator said, are you crazy? If all the slaves have signs and they see how many they are, they would topple us immediately, you know? So that was somehow the idea to develop some way of, uh, of having this idea of resistance. And, you know, on the other side, you know, develop a perspective how we could do it, make it better. And I think we should start building this movement very, very quickly, and with modern technologies, uh, we have ways of communicating, you know, which which can be used to this effect. Now, on the second question, I think um, 
Well, I think, you know, every person, you know, should locate uh, their identity in the context of universal history. Because I think we are all <clears throat> part of one species and we are connected to previous generations by the heritage we got from them. And as my favorite poet Friedrich Schiller said, we should have a noble desire to give that knowledge to future generations enriched through our own contribution. And if you connect yourself, your own identity with the heritage of the past, with the idea to give it enlarged to the future, then you are connected in the world, but you still can be inner directed and you still can find the spark of your own creativity. And in a certain sense, the earlier you find in your own life that which makes you as an individual truly creative for the purpose of serving mankind better, the, the better it is. Some people live their whole life and they never come to this recognition. And then, you know, when somebody closes the grave, then on the tombstone they write, this person ate 5,500 hamburgers and he had so many disco dances and then they close the, uh, you know, the thing and it's over. I mean, that's obviously what you don't want. You want that people remember you because you wrote beautiful poems, which were as important as Cervantes or as important as Goya's paintings. Or you want to do something where people remember you as having contributed to the ennoblement of civilization. And to look inside your soul and to find that and find the agape, you know, because I believe in the Corinthian uh, 13th letter, you can have every riches of the world. And if you don't have love, you have nothing. And I think this culture of love for civilization and love of mankind and love for your neighbor, that is what is lacking most, especially in the youth culture. Because the youth, they are so cool and so, you know, <clears throat> but they lack very much this compassion. And those of you who have this divine spark already a little bit discovered in you, just cultivate it, make it more rich, fertilize it, you know, apply it, use it. And I'm very optimistic that, you know, if we can spark this idea among many young people around the world, oligarchism will be something you can admire in the zoo or in the museum. We will have in the uh, beautiful museum in Madrid one section, an archaeological section for oligarchs and uh, other such people. And then p school classes can go there and say, oh, oh, this was a species which didn't make it. Therefore, we have them now in the museum. And we move on. I can't wait to see all these screenies in these museums. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Helga. Uh, you really showed us that uh, we are again in a very great historical chance and uh, to collaborate, participate, ask questions, uh, write us at preguntas at laroushepub.com. Preguntas at laroushepub.com. And I think you should help us to, uh, yeah, fulfill two promises, uh, which was quite uh, telling during these presentations and dialogue questions. Um, to make sure that it will never ever happen again, that the generation is called a no future generation or a neither nor generation. And the other one is that this will be not uh, the last uh, such discussion. And uh, I want to thank you very much that you participated.